Hi, welcome. My name is Warren Bayek. I'm in the CTO office of Wind River, a member of the Starling X community. And I want to talk today about enabling the intelligent edge of Starling X. Um, Craig uh, Griffin is on your, your uh, syllabus. He may be able to pop in a little later, but he's not here right now, obviously. So I want to talk about the intelligent edge in the new machine economy and Starling's X, Starling X's place in it. And what do we mean by this? Well, a new intelligent machine economy is the next wave of digital transformation. So the first or pre the previous wave was about that we're, we've been taking part in the past 10 years was all about creating this cloud computing infrastructure that met the needs of integrated public and private clouds, regardless of size, by being simple to implement and massively scalable. So OpenStack provided software-defined infrastructure needed to create the data centers for this environment. It's capable of deploying VMs at massive scale, right? So an infrastructure that was scalable and automated. Collecting data, analyzing it in a central location, creating improved customer options and experiences, along with leveraging that data to create business and operational advantages, those were the keys to the previous generation. It was really centered on the cell phone, right? Connecting people to people and people to processes and systems, data centers, and using that data intelligently to enable us to have a better experience with each other and with, with companies to be able to use that data to create products and services that satisfied our needs. In terms of connectivity, as I said, the cell phone was really the primary way that this came to light. So think about 10 years ago and how different the world was than the world we live in today. The things you do today without thinking 10 years ago would have been science fiction, right? A lot of things that happened in our daily lives would have been science fiction just 10 years ago. No one had any idea what impact the cell phone and other things, other ways we interact with each other and interact with the internet and the data center world would be possible. 10 years from now, I want to say the world will be equally different. Things we consider science fiction today, it's going to be part of our everyday lives. What those things are, I don't know, but I do know they will be happening. So that's what the next wave is about. We've already entered this wave. It's enabling the new machine economy. As I said, the first wave is really about connecting us, people, with each other and with information. Well, the next wave is going to be more about connecting the, the devices at this intelligent edge with each other, having them interact, communicate, and do interesting and intelligent things as part of, as Jeff Gowan, if you listen to the keynote yesterday, mentioned as part of sort of a rolling data center is one way we like to look at it. So the data center paradigm is shifting. Many of the tasks performed today in those massive centralized data centers, they're going to be moving further and further out to this new machine economy edge. Some of the requirements to make this happen are going to be things like low latency, ultra connectivity, highly available systems. There's some statistics up there that show how important this is going to be. Obviously, it's well underway, but even said, you can see, aerobotics, 70% of GDP between now and 2030, 70% of the growth is going to be in this area. Um, every business is thinking about this. So we're all on a path to the future where the data produced by these devices is expanding exponentially. And the way they need to communicate with each other and the things the devices are going to need to be able to do at the device level, as well as at the network infrastructure level and the data center level are increasing exponentially as well. So we need an infrastructure that can support this new intelligent edge economy. According to Gartner, this new world will be worth $2 trillion in economic activity by 2030, $2 trillion. So what's happened so far? You may have seen this picture if you've been to some of these talks before, but OpenStack and Starling X have taken this idea of software-defined infrastructure from the core to the infrastructure edge, which is where currently today, in virtual RAN environments, Starling X is running in the Verizon network, as Jeff mentioned yesterday, with a, with a 5G virtual RAN 
deployment across North America. So that's the second bullet in, the infrastructure edge we call that. But beyond that is the device edge. That's where the intelligent machine economy is gonna happen. That's the big growth pattern that I just, you just saw in those previous statistics. That's where all the new infrastructure that we're putting into place has to support that last mile intelligent edge. You know, think about what it is. It's really, the way to think of it is as a place, not a thing, right? It's, it's the manufacturing floor, um, a campus, a city, a car, airplanes, underwater things, um, sports arenas, battlefields, all of these areas, that is the last mile, the device intelligent edge that we're talking about enabling with this new infrastructure. That's happening now because at this edge, as I said, these devices are going to be able to need to perform AI, as you, AI obviously in the last six months, all of us have heard nonstop stories about where AI is going. That's gonna play out in this intelligent edge. So where those devices need to be able to use this infrastructure to communicate with each other and do AI things that they're capable of doing within the device, but they also need to share that data at each of these levels so that each level can process and do the correct thing based on the requirements of the device AI implementations. So how does Starling X play, play into this? What is it first? I'm gonna run through a quick overview of what Starling X is. I'll be massively simplified here. If you wanna get into deeper depth of what Starling X is, how you use it, the, the, the nuts and bolts, kind of the sausage making, if you will, there's nine-ish sessions coming over the next two days. This is more intended to be more of a little bit high level, so bear with me as I kind of blast through this, but if you wanna get into deeper level, meet with some of the engineers in the other sessions and they can, they'll go through some really specific things in the other, just if you search for Starling X in the program, you'll see all the sessions that are coming up. But to massively oversimplify it, so Starling X was formed five years ago in response to thinking about the differences required to support the kind of edge infrastructure that I talked about versus the OpenStack type data center infrastructure. If you think about the biggest differences, while the scalability and other things I'll talk through a few specifically are the same, the differences, they're geographically separated. For, take for instance your Nova Compute instances could be the controllers here, the workers miles away. Very different paradigm than in a data center. Same thing with Kubernetes. Your masters could be potentially tens or hundreds of miles separated from the worker nodes, right? That just won't work with the kind of connectivity and the availability of the networks between those systems. So a new infrastructure had to be designed. So five years ago, Wind River co-founded Starling X along with Intel to manage some of those problems. So as you, it's an open source project. It's part of the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Confer, it's a open infrastructure pro, confirmed project. So it's open source, open design, open development, a very open community. It's a full stack supplying a complete cloud and infrastructure solution. It's distributed, as I said, geo distributed so that the workers, the, the sub clouds, we call them nodes, can be distributed geographically separate from the controllers and the optimized edge subcloud is really the part I want to focus on today. So what do we mean by optimized? Well, the scalability is critical. Um, just like the current data center, the scales has to go into the thousands. Of course, the difference is, again, this scalability happens geographically. So that creates a new set of problems that had to be solved. In terms of reliability, unlike the data center where your three and four nines um, reliability, some of the applications that live at those edge, if you thought about what was happening out there, we're talking about cars, we're talking about aeroplanes, data telecom centers, I mean, data telecom connections. Out there, you expect five and six nines reliability. Very, very different paradigm than the typical data center IT requirements, because lives could be at stake. Small footprint is obviously critical. As you scale to the thousands or tens of thousands of edge sites, if you have a solution that takes two or three or four or five servers, under the typical model with a controller, workers, storage servers. Do the math on the equation as you get to the, the uh, cost equation becomes very different if you have a hyper-conferred solution like Starling X where we can bring all of that into one server. And the server itself is optimized and I'll touch on that a little bit later. 
Ultra low latency, as I mentioned, when you're at the far edge, we're talking latency at the, out there is measured in microseconds. So <coughs> latency is not data center, is not at the same scale as a data center. And finally, edge, edge security and lifecycle management. Security is important everywhere. At the edge, it's a different, it's again a different discussion because you don't have kind of a walled area where everything's in one place, everything can kind of be controlled. You're geographically separated, you have physical security problems, you have an unsecured network connecting you to the back to the core, so there are new security concerns that had to be addressed. And in terms of the, the uh, life cycle management, we, do, we knew from uh, OpenStack's experience that the requirements to put life cycle management into the product from the beginning natively was very important for those of you who uh, worked with OpenStack early on, how difficult it was to upgrade and keep track of was something we realized we had to get into starting up from the beginning. So that's a quick overview of where Starling, how Starling X came to be and where it's gone. Um, so what do we use this infrastructure for? Well, today, as I mentioned, about two and a half years ago, Verizon started rolling out the first virtual RAN uh, environment using Starling X at the, as their VRAN host, hosted inf infrastructure. Um, Vodafone and KDDI are also following along. So what's happened is we've proven scalability and reliability at massive scale now. That question's been answered for Starling X. But we're here to talk about additional use cases beyond telco. It's interesting to me that Starling X has become kind of the de facto virtual RAN telco solution because there's really nothing specific in Starling X to do with telco. It just happens to be a great use case that is monetizable today and the first place that <laughs> customers were willing to give it a shot. So as Jeff said yesterday, this is really important. We've used two and a half years to harden Starling X to the point where it's ready for any environment now. So other use cases, I, we just threw a few up on here. Um, Software-defined vehicles, really important one. We know that's coming, enabling, enabling hazard information sharing, autonomous driving, sa enhanced safety. Um, A&D, the Aerospace and Defense Department of the United States is already starting to define uh, advanced battle, battle management systems. So they're creating a network environment that Starling X fits into perfectly. Um, smart electric grids, not just smart devices where Starling X can help applications, host applications that are intelligent device management of energy, but also energy grids who can share information and manage the grid more efficiently. Um, Industrial manufacturing, some obvious use cases there with low latency, hyper available, hyper secure environments. Medical, already, we're already starting to see telesurgery things happening. Obviously, you need massively available and, and reliable systems there with incredibly low latency. Robotics, drone delivery, the list goes on and on. But really, the important thing is I don't know the killer app, neither do you. But someone in here is going to come up with ideas that can use this infrastructure. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to go through a couple use cases because I know, as I said earlier, I know in 10 years this world will be very different. Some of the people in this room and at this conference will play a part in that. And we want them to think about Starling X being the infrastructure to host the applications that are going to change our world. So I'm going to talk about a few examples today. One that's obvious, monetizable, and is happening and the other that's quite exotic, and really I'm just gonna bring it up as an example of what could be, just to get your mind thinking a little bit out of the box. Um, the first is the software-defined vehicle. We talk about this a lot. One of the differences here with the existing telco infrastructure, if you think about what the telco use case is, telco, is near, if you think about that drawing that I had with the, as you worked further to the left, you were getting more to the device edge. At the very far edge of that in the telco environment are the radio towers. Starling X sits one place in from that on the, on the infrastructure of the telco. So we host applications like VRAN applications, Mac applications that control things at the radio edge. The autonomous vehicle is potentially a little different in that we actually could extend Starling X into the device. So this device would essentially become a subcloud in, our nomen in the Starling X nomenclature. Um, and that's happening today. The, these companies are beginning to create this environment. GM has said they expect publicly in their reports to the, to the street 20 to 25 
billion dollars in annual revenue via software. By 2030, I believe the date, or, and today that's about two billion. So you can see where GM expects to see a massive part of their growth over the next six or seven years. Ford's followed suit. All the car companies are saying the same thing to their investors. Car companies are quickly becoming software companies. Obviously, Tesla is the, the uh, poster child in this, right? The software, the, the software in a Tesla is essentially the car. All car companies are going to be software companies 10 years from now. And we believe with this type of an architecture, the car is going to be, it literally is going to be a rolling data center. The difference with a car, it has to be hyper-connected. If, it's, if, we're going to innate, if we're going to realize the V2X things that I've listed here, vehicle to vehicle communication, device infrastructure, some of these are happening already and they use well-defined protocols within the car. Some need to communicate to devices, street signs. Some will need to communicate with each other for, for intelligent traffic control. Um, the use cases are enormous. And the, one of the interesting things that has to happen within a car is there are mixed criticality services running. Some of those things, your, your, your infotainment system, not so important, right? Your, your ability to realize a kid's running in front of the car, critically important. Those have to live together. And Starling X provides a way to separate and keep each pod, each container in its own box and let the, criticality, let the critical systems have preference over the other systems. There's some other things that could happen in a car too, for instance, um, some of the applications or pods don't need to run when you're driving the car. The things that unlock your door, you know, if that's a software system, it, when you get near the car, that has to be enabled. But once you're in the car running, you don't have to have some of the things running. So Starling X gives you an easy way to manage applications within the car so you can use the resources more efficiently. Unlike a data center, the Resources in a car are basically inelastic. Once you're in the car, you have what you have. So you have to have an intelligent way to use those resources and not have everything running all the time. And Starling X gives you good ways to manage the applications and the resources within the car. Um, so in this world, this is, this is where people like GM, Ford, and others are looking to figure out an infrastructure that will support this. Starling X has the perfect answer for all the questions that are being asked about the infrastructure and all the demands being put on it. And as I said, this is happening. It may be a few years away, but th this vision is, is on route, and we expect Starling X to play a major role in it. Now I'm going to take you down a little different path, and this is just to get you thinking. I, I actually just was listening to a podcast last week and came across this company. Um, I don't know how it's pronounced, Pidgeo, maybe, Fast Info. It's a Boston-based company, and they create basically robotic Sherpas to follow you without you requiring to be managing a joystick, without you, um, you know, having to interact with it in any way. It's an intelligent device that knows how to manage. It's really built for kind of the 15-minute city that you've heard about, and it allows people, such as this woman who's carrying a baby, Typically, she wouldn't be able to do things in that environment. She couldn't go shopping because I have to take my kid and do those sorts of things. Well, this gives you an option to have the Sherpa follow you along. You can go to the market, throw things in it, and it will come take, care, take care of everything and go home with you. Well, it has to manage things like, how do I get across the street? How do I wait for, no, it's time to stop here and I have to wait. You notice she doesn't have a, a joystick in her hand or her cell phone out and watching it. It's the, the machine itself is intelligent enough to know what she needs to have happen and make it happen. It's pretty rudimentary right now, but if you go to Seattle or Boston or London, you may see some of these wandering around the streets. It's kind of interesting. Very exotic today, right? Who would ever, who would ever think this is going to take off? But again, 10 years from now, things like this, and I'm not saying this will be it, but something like this will be part of your life. And if you're in the development environment of this and you have some need in a network infrastructure, come talk to us at Starling X. Come by the booth and let's discuss it. We can talk about ways we can make this happen for you. In terms of that, I, I, I just want to say one, I want to talk about one interesting, successful collaboration like this we've recently had. Again, it's in the telco environment because that's where this market is already taking off with Starling X. 
A few years ago, Intel started a, a project for a new silicon, uh, for the fourth generation Sapphire Rapids. So we talked with Intel about what we could do in the telco space to make that an attractive offering and decided that we would try to minimize the footprint of Starling X to give applications more room on these servers. Just like the car, which has an inelastic amount of resources once it's built, without obvious upgrades, cell towers are the same, right? If you, you see your cell tower at the bottom, there's a building. In that building is a server, or two, or three, or whatever they put in. Once they're in there, that's it. That's what you have. So minimizing the footprint of things like infrastructure is critical. So with, with Intel, and Encora joined us. We we're happy to have them join the Starling X group. And Wind River, we collaborated on the requirements. We worked through the Starling X community to get the things into place that needed to be done to enhance and optimize that use case. And the most recent release has Starling X running on one core of the Sapphire Rapids silicon. And I bring that up just to say it's a place where a silicon vendor had a use case. They came to the community. We figured out what they needed within the infrastructure. We made it happen, and we delivered something to the market that is going to change the, the shape of the Verizon network and other telco networks to come. So again, as you come up with use cases where you can use low latency, high, high availability, you know all the things that I mentioned earlier, all the benefits and advantages of Starling X, please come by the booth. Join the, join the uh, community. Let us talk about what we can do within the infrastructure together to enable your use case and bring it to market faster. So we have some, yeah, we kind of talked, we, we have some resource, resources at the end here. Here's some ways to get to start the Starling X community. We have a booth here. As I said, the rest of this, the rest of these two days, you're going to have eight or nine or ten Starling X presentations that will get into detail of how we do things like upgrades, how we did the Starling X project, how we, some of the new deployment models we're looking at. But there's some engineers here who are going to drill very deep and give you some really good examples. So I encourage you to look through your, your uh, syllabus and see what Starling X opportunities make sense to you to go see, and to come visit us at the booth if you need any help with your application, your service, your infrastructure des decisions, anything you need, this kind of an infrastructure, please come talk to us and we'll be happy to help. Thanks. Any questions? Um, well, that was a pretty specific instance, and I, I don't know if I can get into details, but Wind River had, you know, we're part of the Starling X community. We knew that going forward there would be, Intel was interested because they obviously will sell more silicon, which is their business. Um, and Core is interested because they're going to go, they're helping with the Starling X project. And Wind River, the, the, we, we have a, a engineering group obviously it already contributes to Starling X. We have an upstream first development model, so everything we do goes into Starling X. So really all the companies had a end goal that I mean an end revenue model that made sense. So we all contributed some of the money together to help each other get there. Does that help? Well, like, so the, the, the nuts and bolts of the collaboration, we, we literally had teams from each of those groups getting together regularly. Um, so everybody was kind of contributing manpower more than anything. And we, we had very close weekly, if at mostly weekly meetings and made sure, you know, made sure from an engineering perspective the right things were being done in the community. Um, you know, it was a long project. Intel is an interesting partner to work with, obviously, and it was a, a year plus uh, effort to get there and we used the u that because that was a specific use case and I assume you all would have the same kind of thing we we went kind of the agile model where we brought in the Verizon and we talked them through it as well to make sure that it was landing right and that it had a market when we were finished and and again Wind River can help with that if you have 
you know, customers, we have a lot of reach. Um, being a 30-year company doing something, a lot of you probably have heard of Wind River from the, the VX Works days. Um, so we have a lot of reach and a lot of customer out, output. So we can help the Starling X community get into maybe some places and get conversations with customers that may be unreachable for some. But any other questions? All right, good, thank you.